This episode of On The Beat is brought to you by Ingles. Shop online with Ingles Curbside Pickup. New curbside stores opening every week. Please welcome Mike Griffith. Hi well, everybody, Mike Griffith here. Welcome to tonight's Ingles On The Beat segment. And we're going to talk about Georgia spring football. We're going to talk about Georgia baseball. We're going to talk about Georgia basketball. We can talk a little Georgia softball. Let's start it out with Kirby Smart and some of his recent comments in a one-on-one -on -one interview with ESPN. Now, Kirby met with the local media last Tuesday. He meets every Tuesday with the media. But then afterward, he met with ESPN's Chris Lowe, and I thought Kirby had a lot of interesting things to say. And among those things, ironically enough, was that he wished that Nick Saban hadn't retired. I posted a story on that. And everybody is saying April Fools, that really that Kirby would. No, it's not April Fools. This is not an April Fools from Kirby Smart. He really does wish that Nick Saban had not retired because he likes competing with him. And Kirby admitted uh, that he would have liked to have played him again. Um, now, he didn't say it, it wasn't eating him, eating him up because it was kind of put to him that way. But he did say that, yeah, he would have wanted to play against Nick Saban again and you know, when I look at where the Georgia football team is right now, I understand that. Like, I thought Georgia was better than Alabama last year when both teams were at their best. But obviously, there were some key injuries to Georgia. And I think their schedule uh, really ran them down in the month of November when you consider uh, they played Missouri, Old Miss, Tennessee, and, and a pretty feisty Georgia Tech on the road. Uh, the last game of the season, and we all know uh, Brock Bowers and Ladd McConkey were not at 100%. And then credit to Jalen Milrow, who probably played the game of his life, and Alabama didn't make mistakes, and and uh, Carson back in, in Georgia uh, made a couple of those mistakes. So I thought it was very interesting that Kirby would say uh, that he wished um, that Saban hadn't retired, um, you know, in terms of wanting to play him again. You know, he said, you know, we've had some really close games and some really great games. Uh, but, yeah, I wish he was still there. I wish he was still around so that I could get more shots in him because I hadn't done real well against him. Of course, the record being one in five. And yet when I think about the Georgia-Alabama series with Kirby and Saban, I don't think about it being that lopsided because of the way the 2017 title game turned out. Uh, with Alabama having to come from behind and win in overtime. And I think about the 2018 game where Alabama came from behind again, uh, Georgia with a key injury to DeAndre Walker. I think about the 2020 game <laughs> when Georgia was beating Alabama and Tuscaloosa at halftime. And then uh, I think Stetson had three interceptions that night. And it turned out to be a national championship team uh, for Alabama in that COVID shortened season of 2020. Schedules weren't the same either. When I think of 2020, it's one that got away. Remember Richard LeCount and the motorcycle accident the night they beat Kentucky and Jordan Davis and the elbow injury in the Kentucky game, both those players missing when they lost to Florida. Otherwise, you probably would have seen Georgia play Alabama again in 2020 in the SEC title game. 2021, uh, you think about Georgia's national championship, first national championship season, a loss to Alabama in the SEC championship game and then in the revenge matchup. Uh, the Georgia defense settles in and, and beats Bama, albeit uh, Mechie and Jameson, their two best receivers, uh, both with some injury issues as well. And then, of course, last year, the SEC title game. And all these games were hard fought. I suppose the only lopsided game in there was the 2021 uh, SEC championship game. And again, some, some interceptions and issues for Stetson in that game. Uh, but for the most part, these have been very hard fought close games. So, you know, while it's 5-1 Saban, uh, these are all very contested games that I feel like most all of them, but maybe with the exception of one, could have gone either way. So I, I get Kirby's vibe with wanting to play this guy again. And especially when you look at, you know, Saban lost twice to Dabo and Kirby beat Dabo, of course, in the 2021. And, and they'll have an opportunity to match up with Dabo Sweeney and Clemson again uh, in this year's season opening game in Atlanta. Uh, that'll obviously be pretty key. Obviously, Saban lost to Harbaugh in his last game and Kirby beat uh, Harbaugh in the Orange Bowl just a couple of years ago. So you could play some transitive properties. You look at the struggles Alabama's had with Auburn and and, and Georgia's had some pretty good success of late. So uh, bottom line, though, no, not in April Fool's. Kirby really does wish Saban was around. And 
And I give Kirby credit um, because in the course of this interview with ESPN, he was asked a couple of times about Nick Saban. And obviously this is a guy that Kirby respects and admires. He worked for him for a long time and he gives him a lot of credit. But, but Nick Saban's retired now. Typically when a coach retires, you know, people don't keep talking about him so much. And you would think this is when Kirby Smart would get his attention. Uh, I brought it up last week on the program and, and I'll bring it up this week. It, it just blows my mind that Georgia hasn't lost a regular season game in four years. And Kirby's won two national titles in that span and had a record-breaking 29-game win streak, and yet he's never been the coach of the year in any of those seasons. I, I just don't know how that's possible, but, you know, maybe some of it's society with, you know, wanting to, you know, lift up the weaker guy and give coach of the year to the guy whose team was supposed to be bad and, you know, actually won nine or ten games instead of five or six. Instead of just giving it to the best guy, you know, I, I think that's more of an indictment on our sports society right now. Because 20 or 30 years from now, uh, when I'm having that conversation with my grandson or granddaughter or whomever, and they say, Mike, you covered that Georgia program back in the era when Kirby Smart was winning championships. And um, I was just looking it up the other day. Was Eli Drinkwitz that good of a coach? And I say, well, what do you mean? I say, well, he was named the SEC Coach of the Year over Kirby and Nick Saban that year. And I say, no, he really wasn't that good of a coach. But that's just how people voted back then. They didn't vote for the best coach to be the Coach of the Year. Did you hear what I just said? We don't vote for the best coach to be the Coach of the Year. Okay. All right. How much longer before the team with the most points isn't the winner anymore? I, I mean, I, when I was young, I bowled in a handicap league. We'd get like 35 pins. The other team might outroll us, but because we were worse bowlers, we would get these pins and we would, it was, it was called handicap bowling. We've hit the handicap stage of awards now for coaches? Apparently so. Anyway, uh, digress. Get back on track here. Uh, Kirby Smart also said in this ESPN interview, and I thought this was interesting. He said that Carson Beck had a bit of arrogance to him, but then he said, but he's not holier than thou. So in one breath, Kirby talked about Carson having some maybe conceit, right? But at the same time, you know, being able to laugh at, laugh at himself. Okay. I guess it balances out I look at quarterbacks and and I don't know that that I want arrogance as much as I want confidence. And maybe it's wrong and maybe you all will disagree, but in terms of the ideal disposition for a quarterback, for a Georgia quarterback, I thought that was Jake Fromm. I thought Jake Fromm was a guy that carried himself in model fashion. I felt like Jake was always confident. I thought he was always clear. I thought he was always positive. Um, and, and at times, uh, he took a lot of responsibility for himself. You know, Jake would blame himself for situations that really weren't his fault. All right. Because he was the quarterback and he was raised to take on that responsibility. And I thought, you know, Jake Fromm is the guy, if you could take Jake Fromm's disposition and attitude and put that in Carson back, I think you'd have a pretty popular quarterback. Um, Carson, obviously with an NFL arm. Carson with probably uh, more mobility than Jake. I think both quarterbacks were fantastic at the pre-snap read. Jake's still in the NFL, by the way. For all the people that, that are critical of Jake, Jake Fromm is still in the NFL. He can be real talented uh, to be a number two or a number three quarterback. And, and who knows, maybe Jake will one day get his break there. But I thought Jake was a very good quarterback. Obviously good enough to win a national championship as a true freshman, had a safety not blown an assignment. Jake Fromm did his job, folks. He led you to a national title offensively if your defense can make a stop on second and 26. Um, so, but anyway, the, the comments on Beck were interesting. And then Kirby also said that it's time to let this cat go and make some plays. Uh, he talked about how at the beginning of last year, how maybe they were a little slow to let Carson, uh, I don't think he said go downfield, but um, maybe – I'm trying to think of the way he put that. Well, I mean, here's the quote. He, he said, early in, in the year last season, we probably did try to protect him too much. He said, but then you see that nothing ever really affects him, and you know you've just got to let the cat go play. 
because we were either going to make it or not make it on his back. And as the year went on, he got better and better, but we were probably a little slow with him out of the gate. In other words, they tried to protect Carson from turnovers or any sort of adversity. And then as it turned out, Carson is a guy who can handle adversity on the field. Carson is a guy who can bounce back from turnovers. And what Kirby's saying is maybe you should have thrown him a little deeper in the water a little sooner. Um, but, but as things evolved, I think we saw Carson. I thought he looked outstanding against Ole Miss. I thought he was particularly sharp against Tennessee. Um, Georgia Tech was a challenging game for the whole team. And then I didn't think he played real well against Alabama, maybe in spurts. But, gosh, I keep going back to that underthrown ball to Arian Smith. If it's on target, it's seven. Instead, it's underthrown. And uh, you have to settle for three, and that's four points, and it's a three-point game. Uh, that's one you know Carson wishes he had back. So this year, uh, a lot's going to be on Carson's shoulders again. I made an SEC Network appearance last week, and I made some comments that I thought more would be on Carson Beck's shoulders uh, this season than last season. And I also said that I didn't think that Carson had as good of a supporting cast as Stetson Bennett had. And some people took offense to that. They, they took that as a criticism of Stetson, and it wasn't meant to be that. But what it was meant to say was that Carson won't have Brock Bowers this year, and he won't have Vlad McConkey this year, and he never had a Donnie Mitchell, uh, and he never had James Cook, and he never had Zamir White, um, and, and he didn't have Kenny McIntosh last year. And I thought those were all better players – uh, than what you're going to have this year. Now, now we'll wait and see. Um, and in the second segment of this program, I'm going to bring out what I think are the three best position groups on this football team. But my point is, uh, I also don't think the defense is going to be as good either. And neither does Kirby Smart, by the way. Kirby Smart said uh, that he felt like the one thing he's seen this spring is how good the offensive line has been playing uh, and that they've uh, – you know, got the better of the defensive line. And his comment was, it's not to say that Georgia was so par on the defensive line last year. We just weren't great, he says. Uh, he said, we didn't have a dominant guy, but we were always going to, he said, but we're always going to be good on defense. I don't know that we're going to be great this year, but I think we have a chance to be great on offense. That puts a lot on the shoulders of Carson Beck. Stetson, um, came up big in a lot of games, but I also think he had a championship defense that kept George in a lot of games. So I thought there was a little bit bigger margin for error uh, for Stetson and, and JT Daniels, for that matter, when JT was the starting quarterback uh, during that championship run. So I think the quarterback has more on their shoulders now. I think the defense isn't as good as it was in 2021 uh, or 2022, maybe not even 2020. And, Obviously, that's something that has been an ongoing storyline as Kirby Smart talks about not having havoc makers uh, or train wreckers uh, on that front line. Um, this is still a playoff team. This is still a team that I think you're going to see in a tournament. But we're going to have to wait and see how the season progresses, who stays healthy, and how these Bulldogs evolve. Again, segment two, we're going to break down the best position groups. Now, speaking of tournaments, the men's basketball team is in the NIT tournament. They're one of the last six teams playing. They're one of the final two SEC teams playing. Alabama, of course, made the final four. Uh, you know, Georgia had Alabama down by 11 points in the second half. They had Tennessee down by 11 points in the second half. And, and I asked Mike White about that on a Zoom press conference today at Hinkle Fieldhouse in Indianapolis. And Mike said he felt like maybe last year the team got a little tight offensively and that, that maybe, you know, local media, maybe fans uh, talking a bit too much about the NCAA tournament and must win games and that the team wasn't maybe as process focused as it was or process oriented as it was results oriented. I'm not sure if I'm willing to take the blame for wanting or suggesting that Georgia needed to win games. To me, I think you need to be mentally tough enough to understand that you got to win games. I don't think that's a bad thing. Um, you know, this this whole do your best, you know, thing, I know that's, you know, from a psychological standpoint, do your best and let the results fall. Uh, that sounds good if it helps you sleep good at night. But that's not reality, uh, especially when you're talking about, 
where Georgia basketball at and, and, and what Mike was hired to do. Now that said, I think Mike did a really good job with his basketball team, bringing all these different bodies together. They had a 10 game win streak. They had some very impressive wins against the ACC going on the road to beat Florida state, beating Georgia tech again, beating Wake Forest twice. But I think we will find out more uh, about this basketball team in the future when they play Seton Hall. It's a 930 game on Tuesday night. I'll be checking that out. Now let's go ahead and take a break. I want to recognize our sponsor, Ingles. Appreciate Ingles. Ingles has been with us from the start. Uh, they make this Monday night program possible. Uh, so let's sit back, pay attention to this message from our sponsor, Ingles. When we come back, we'll break down the three top Georgia football position groups. At Ingles, we're proud to work with hundreds of local farms and businesses in the communities we call home. Not only does it ensure that you get top quality fresh items for your family table, it's a way for us to support the amazing individuals who pour their heart and soul into delivering the very best they can do. Quality, freshness, community, it's all in the bag. Ingles, low prices, love the savings. The program, best three position groups on the Georgia football team, as I see it right now in the spring, and I kind of tipped off the first one when Kirby Smart was talking uh, about how the offensive line had fared so well. And, and he said, he, you know, he kind of suggested he wasn't sure if if that was an indictment on the defensive line. Um, I, do, I do think it has more to do with the talent of the offensive line. And you start to think about a lot of these players across the front four, five, excuse me, and you think about guys like Tate Ratledge and, um, you think about guys like Xavier Truss. And when they came in, who was on the other side of the ball, right? Uh, Ernest Green, for that matter. Jalen Carter was over there. Uh, maybe they got a piece of Jordan Davis. Maybe they got a piece of Devontae Wyatt. Or, or maybe they practiced against the number one pick in the draft, uh, Trayvon Walker. Um, Nolan Smith was a guy that certainly they went up against in drills. When you're going against first-round NFL talent, you're going to get better early in your career. You're going to have a different work ethic. And I think that where this Georgia offensive line grew was in its youth. And now these guys are all grown up. And now it's their turn to dominate. And you hope this means that the future Georgia defensive linemen are going to be bigger, better, faster, stronger, and you're going to get back to that dominant form when Georgia led the nation in run defense. What was it, four out of five years they were number one, and the other year they were number two? And then last year they dropped all the way down to 18. And that was a problem, right? They weren't able to stop Alabama when they needed to. Um, it, it's crazy to think that Georgia would win 29 games in a row. And what were they, 12-0 and 0 at that stage of the season? And then in one game it just all vanishes. And, and you, 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 it's almost like you couldn't believe it when you were watching it because Georgia always would win these games, right? Even when they fell behind South Carolina, even when they fell behind Auburn, you just felt like this Georgia team would find a way, but they couldn't. They weren't good enough at the line of scrimmage. They got beat. This Georgia offensive line looks different. I like that it's Ernest Green's second year as the starting left tackle. And I, I know the center is very important. And, yes, you lose Cedric Van Pran. And he was probably, from an operations standpoint, the most reliable center in the nation. A lot of high talk about Jared Wilson. A lot of confidence there. Don't know that you can expect him to step in and be said uh, from a command and a leadership standpoint. But the good news is you have a second-year quarterback, a second-year starter, I should say, a fifth-year quarterback in Carson Beck. And Carson's going to be able if – if there's a little bit off at center, Carson's going to make it right. So I feel good about that battery right there. Left tackle – uh, Dylan Fairchild is a guy that emerged, very physical, obviously you no know, former championship wrestler. But I'll tell you, the guy we visited with the other day, Michael Morris, was very impressive. I mean, this guy was wide-bodied and liked to hit people and has waited for this opportunity. And talking to Michael Morris and seeing that fire in his eyes, you said, oh, man, I'd hate to line up across from this guy every day. Uh, you're going to be real good at left guard. I don't know if it's Dylan. I don't know if it's Mike. It's probably both. But there's going to be some fire coming out of that spot. And then at right guard, you got Tate Ratledge. And it's interesting that Kirby Smart would say uh, that there was some guys that came back for another year. He said that he didn't want them to come back just to come back. 
they need to get better. And he mentioned Tate Ratledge in that. And Tate is a guy, I enjoy his podcasts. I, I think they're clever and funny. He seems like, like a really good, positive locker room force. It'll be interesting to see how Tate Ratledge dominates at the offensive guard position. How high can Tate build himself up in the NFL draft? You don't typically see a lot of guards drafted in the first round, but Tate is big and strong and fast and physical, and he's going to be important to the run game. Uh, Tate Ratledge is by nature a leader, and it's going to be up to him to set the tone. And I know he's a bit of a jovial guy, and he likes to have fun. Uh, Jordan Davis was that way too, but Jordan found that way to, to be that fun, jovial guy and yet be the fire and the guy that everybody talked about. And, and I wonder if that can be Tate Ratledge this offseason. I'll be interested to see um, because I think this young man has a, a tremendous future and a tremendous upside. But can he bring what Georgia needs from a leadership standpoint? I think George is missing vocal leadership. We've heard Kirby say that, that Carson's not the most assertive guy. He's not the most vocal guy. And, you know, I look at other positions and I say, well, where's the offensive Where's the voice? Where's the voice in the huddle? Who's the voice that says we're going to get this done? Who's the voice that puts the foot down? Who's the voice? Who's the foot that goes up the tail when things don't go right? Is that Tate Ratledge? It needs to be somebody on offense because Carson's not a very vocal guy and not an assertive guy, according to Kirby Smart. Right tackle is Xavier Truss. And I remember Xavier got pressed into action. Remember the Georgia-Cincinnati game? Um, of course, everybody talks about Georgia playing an undefeated Florida State team that didn't get in the playoff. Boo-hoo, right? Well, in 2020, Georgia played an undefeated Cincinnati team that didn't get into the playoff. And Cincinnati didn't opt out, okay? Those guys showed up, and they played, and they had Georgia down double digits in the fourth quarter between before JT Daniels and uh, Kenny McIntosh. Uh, brought them back in the fourth quarter. Uh, but that was Xavier's first game, I think, starting. And he started at left tackle because I think you had an opt-out, um, a Georgia opt-out. You might have had one or two guys who were an injury in, in that game. I know there were some guys um, – I know Eric Stokes didn't play. And I want to say there were some injuries where you had to change up your offensive line and Truss was thrown out there. And, and, and Truss has been around a minute now. He's a big, strong guy, but is he going to become that dominator? I mean, he's been around long enough now, right? I mean, this is 2024, and I'm talking to you about the 2020 season. So that tells you how long Xavier Trust has been around. Is he one of those guys that came back to came back to come back, or is Xavier Trust, you know, going to come up with this edge and you're going to go, oh my gosh, I've never seen this version of this guy? Can he fill the shoes of Amarius Mims? Because Amarius was a road grader. Can Xavier Trust be that guy? I, I don't know. I don't know the talent ceiling there. I know that Stacy Sarles has proven himself to be a fantastic coach. And I still remember when he got hired, there were some Georgia fans who were skeptical. I, I, I never really understood that because I think Kirby's made some really good hires. But I think Stacy Sarles has evolved into one of the most valuable coaches in the SEC, maybe the country, not just on the Georgia staff. But I think it's time Georgia fans step back and go, okay, yeah, this guy has done a heck of a job. The offensive line was was uh, adequate last year. Okay, it wasn't elite. Uh, they didn't uh, get the push when they needed against Alabama in short yardage. Mike Bobo called him out for that. I would also put a little bit of that on Carson, his ability to uh, make plays at the line of scrimmage. Um, but I like this Georgia offensive line, and I think it is the strongest unit on the team. And I think that this unit is what gives Georgia a chance to win a national championship. This offensive line, I think this is the team that can finally win, um, you know, the awards trophy is the best offensive line in the nation. So that's something that I look forward to. Number two position, I'm, I'm just going to call this the backfield it, because I, I don't want to say quarterback and I don't want to just say running back. But I think back in tandem with ETN and Rod Robinson, is the key to the explosive dynamic on offense. I, I don't have a lot of faith in the receiving core. I, I've been very blunt about that. I think Georgia has nine transfers on their team, and I want to say five of them are pass catchers. That's an indictment on the position and the lack of development there, in my opinion. 
some of the young guys that transferred out were receivers. That's unfortunate. I still say that if if Adani Mitchell doesn't transfer out, that Georgia wins last year's national championship. I think Carson was one receiver short all year long. That X receiver position never equaled what it was when Adani was there uh, in the playoffs in 2022 and during the stretch run and into the championship game in 2021. I mean, the guy caught four touchdowns at Georgia, I want to say, and all of them were in the playoffs or championship games. And he's a mid-first-round pick. You didn't replace him. I mean, Rod Rod Thomas came in and and was injured and had some off-field stuff, and that that transfer didn't fill those shoes. That was I don't want to say that was a miss, but it wasn't a win. Um, Lovett came in, and I felt like he was adequate, but I didn't feel like he was any step up from Kiaris Jackson or or Dominic Blaylock, um, another adequate guy I thought would be explosive difference maker and wasn't. He was not a difference maker. He wasn't there when you needed him to uplift the team. I mean, that was a big ask. I mean, do I think he did a fine? Okay, yeah, he, he was fine. Check, check the box. Okay, but not dynamic, not, not kaboom, right? Um, ETN, kaboom. I think ETN is a home run hitter. I think ETN is a pass catcher that's going to help Carson out tremendously. Uh, no more Brock Bowers, so you're going to need a safety valve. Uh, I think Oscar Delp is is more than adequate. I think Oscar Delp is Charlie Warner. I think he's an NFL tight end, um, which is to say very, very good. Uh, but I don't think he's Brock Bowers. And so I think you're going to need that short, that, that player that can take the short pass and do a lot after the catch like Brock Bowers did, make your passing numbers look a lot better than they really were, make your quarterback rating look a lot better than it really was. When you've got a tight end that can catch a ball three feet behind him, over his head, uh, you know, run over somebody, make two people miss, all of a sudden you're passing number. Everybody, oh wow, look at these passing numbers. Okay, well, you can thank Brock Bowers for that. So now Brock's gone, and so is Land McConkey, another yard after the catch kind of guy. So who are those guys going to be? Again, questions at receiver. Time for Carson to work that out over the summer time for players to emerge, time for Georgia to go get another receiver out of the portal after spring drills, perhaps. Uh, but right now, all the juice is coming out of ETN and Rod Robinson. And Robinson is a 240-pound back with 7% body fat, Kirby told a group of boosters. I can't wait to see this guy play. He looked impressive against Florida State. Well, didn't everybody. But I, I think this guy is, is going to come to fruition. And then the Frazier kid, the incoming freshman, I want to see what he brings from California. Sometimes uh, running back can be a position that's easier to transition into than other spots. And typically, you'll know a great running back early in their career. You don't have to wait two or three years. If you're waiting two or three years, that's too long. I don't think Georgia's done the best job uh, maybe with some of the young talent they've had in the past. Now, there's been some injuries that have slowed up some guys, but – uh, I think I think at times there's been too much seniority. I'll be interested to see how Coach Crawford manages this. I think they can do better managing that position in terms of getting their most elite talent out there more often. And we'll see what ETN does. He's not the biggest guy. He's not as thick as Swift, um, but he has the same sort of cat-like quickness. I think he's got the same hands. Um, but, boy, that's, that's a tough comparison. Uh, sorry, ETN. I'm glad you changed your number from seven to one, but you're still probably going to get compared to DeAndre Swift. Uh, who I think is the last truly great college back. He certainly was the last Georgia back to be a first team or second team all SEC pick. Georgia has not had an all SEC back since 2019, folks. Um, RBU needs to make a return. I think it will. And I want to group Beck in there because I think Carson's NFL arm and NFL abilities give this team a ceiling. Now, again, it's going to be up to Carson to grow as a leader, it's going to be up to Carson to grow as a teammate and get this chemistry with this receiving core. Carson's talked about how he needs to find more confidence. Um, Carson's talked about how he needs to, you know, challenge himself to avoid complacency because last year was a good year. Um, I think Carson Beck and Kirby Smart probably need to have a really good line of communication. I know Mike Bobo is a guy that's been championed by Aaron Murray as somebody who really teaches these quarterbacks what it means to be a Georgia quarterback. And I guess I'd go back to what I was saying about Jake Fromm's character, Jake Fromm's leadership, and Jake Fromm's disposition. I think you need to see more of that from Carson Beck. Um, it's tough. Uh, again, I mean, when you ask a guy to sit for three years like Carson did, right, and then you, and then you, then you throw him the Superman cape and say, hey, put this on after not playing for three years, that's a big ask. That's a tough ask. 
but it's what Carson signed up for by staying in Georgia. And was he as ready as he needed to be for last year? I, I don't know. I, I know they didn't win. They didn't lose any games uh, because of Carson Beck, but they also didn't win what proved to be the biggest game of the year. Um, and Jalen Milrow at Alabama was the MVP of that game and not Carson Beck. And, and at the end of the day, that hits home hard. Uh, and that's the underlying reality. The third position group, and and the, you might say I'm cheating on this one, but I don't think so. The special teams. I mean, Brett Thorson, this this dude, this dude is so good. I, I know that some of it, the, the no punt return, some of that's Aaron Smith being a fantastic gunner and getting down there, but but a lot of it's Brett Thorson. I mean, it's a grown man, okay, the Australian punter. Um, this guy's got an edge. I like his attitude. I've learned a little bit more about him watching him on Tate Ratledge's podcast. Tate, you can, you can send the, the check in the mail, by the way. I've been promoting his podcast all night. But but Tate and, and Brett do a great job with that. And I've learned more about Brett Thorson. And I like this guy. And I like what he stands for. I like how competitive he is. I like his sense of humor. Uh, um, punters are important. Uh, there's you know Jake Camarda was invaluable his senior year. When I think about Georgia's championship team, Jake Camarda had so much to do with that. And Jake Camarda grew so much the four years that he was at Georgia. And you just take guys like that for granted, but he was special. Uh, we know how special kickers are too, right? Rod Blankenship, certainly. And, um, you know, and then of course the following kicker did an outstanding job. And now you've got uh, Peyton Woodring. And, you know, I think Peyton, I want to say he made. Um, is it 16 kicks in a row? Uh, and we wondered how much would Georgia miss Jack Podlesny when you think about Jack's clutch kicks and you're plugging a true freshman. And remember, Peyton missed a couple kicks early in the season uh, before he bounded back. And I want to say like he made 16 in a row. Pretty strong performance. And I think he's a guy you can count on. Uh, this is a guy I look forward to seeing mature, get even better. Uh, he was my choice on the freshman All-American team. I was glad to see him win that. I know the Auburn freshman had won some other All-American honors, but Peyton won the Football Riders freshman All-American punting slot, and I thought that that was really key. So those are my top three Georgia position groups. I don't know if you agree with me or not. You can put your comments in the section below. I want to take a break right now recognize our sponsor, Anytime Heating, Cooling, and Plumbing. When we come back, I'm going to go over this hot, warm, and cold segment. And this, this week, we actually have hot, warm, and cold uh, on the Georgia teams. Might surprise you who slides into the cold slot, if only temporarily. This might be the only time that you ever hear this player's name listed with cold the rest of his career. So stick with us right after this message from Anytime Heating, Cooling, and Plumbing to make sure your family stays comfortable all year long? Our family of trained comfort specialists are available anytime to service or repair your system. Or it may be time to replace your old units with a new trained HVAC system. We are a locally owned family business and we carefully select the technicians who we send into your home. At any time, heating, cooling, and plumbing, we are large enough to handle all of your HVAC and plumbing needs, but small enough to care. Call today to take advantage of our three-visit annual maintenance plan. Appreciate any time heating, cooling, and plumbing. Um, enjoy seeing families like that. My, uh, I grew up in a, in a household uh, where my father owned his own business. And I can tell you uh, there was a lot of personalization, a lot of effort uh, that went into that. Truly, a lot of pride as well. And uh, it usually means very, very good business. So now the hot, cold, warm. So let me start out with, I'm going to start out with warm. I'm going to say the softball team's warm. Now, you might say, well, no, wait a minute, Mike. This team is ranked number third in the nation. How can they only be? Well, they lost. They lost at home to Arkansas. And, and Arkansas is good. They're top 20. But listen, when you're top five, when you're elite, which I think Georgia softball is, you can't lose at home. You shouldn't lose at home. That's how great this team is. That's the ceiling for this Georgia softball team. You know, when you think about the greatest program in softball right now, it's Oklahoma. For those of you that follow women's softball, uh, you know about Oklahoma softball, the advantages they have being in Oklahoma City, where Team USA is also based. Huge advantage. It'd be very interesting to see what happens to Oklahoma when they come into the SEC. Texas currently ranked number two, by the way. Uh, the SEC is about to have the nine of the top ten teams in the country. Georgia number three, though, and this is a veteran team 
Don't expect them to be losing at home. So that's just – they came back and won the next game, and, and they're 29-5 and five and 6-2 and two in the league, and they've got the number one RPI in the country. They played this murderous row of a schedule. And Tony Baldwin is, is unbelievable. He's a fantastic coach. But these are the sort of games – you don't expect Georgia to slip up. And next week, they'll be at Tennessee. It's going to be very interesting. There'll be some televised games there. One of the bigger challenges for the SEC. I expect Georgia softball to win an SEC championship. They haven't done that in almost 20 years, regular season. So keep your eye on that team at Jack Turner Stadium. I'm going to go to the uh, hot right now. And the hot is this Georgia basketball team. I mean, my goodness. Uh, they knock off Xavier which is a basketball school. Then they go to Wake Forest. Wake had only lost one game at home. They beat Wake on the road. Then they go to the Ohio State. The Ohio State beat Purdue in Columbus earlier this year. And you saw Purdue, uh, what Purdue did to Tennessee with that seven foot four player. Ohio State beat that team in their home arena, but they didn't beat Georgia. And Georgia made five of their last six shots to beat the Buckeyes last week. And the Buckeyes missed their last four. Now, true enough, Georgia basketball gave up a 17-0 run in that game in the second half, but they still won. And uh, and I thought the young guys played well. Blue Kane was phenomenal, had one of those legacy performances. Uh, Silas Demery Jr., another guy they want back. Um, Dylan James, there's a few freshmen uh, that they really want back. And there's four juniors that, that have a year left. And, you know, it's an interesting time for Mike White because the portal is open, and on the one hand, they're having to recruit. Mike said there's been some Zoom calls and some phone conversations, uh, even while they're still playing in season. So I'm a little uh, confused about this basketball portal. Uh, you know, it starts in, you know what, it started at the end of the season, I want to say a week or two ago, and it runs until May 1st. I mean, come on, this is, this is ridiculous. This is a distraction. It led to some teams opting out of the NIT. That's not what you want. Uh, they got they got to figure this out. I mean, there needs to be a little bit more common sense uh, so you don't undermine your postseason tournaments, right? Uh, but but right now, that's a hot team. Uh, and Georgia basketball, 20 wins, that's big. Uh, it's the first time they've won games in the postseason since 2016. So th this is a, a step. Uh, we mentioned earlier in the program, I mean, Georgia was beating Alabama by 11 points uh, in the second half when they played them. Alabama's a Final Four team. It, it, maybe they're really not that far off. Maybe just one player, maybe one player, maybe two, but they're close uh, because they were competitive. They had a 10-game win streak. They're very hot right now. Now, for once and only, and, and this is going to be the only time I'll probably ever put Charlie Conan and Cold in the same sense. Charlie had his first 0 for 4 game of the year. Now, it's baseball. There's going to be nights you go for 4, but you're never, probably never going to hear Charlie Conan associated with Cold. Ever again, ever. So I'm going to say it, that this is the only time I can say it. He had an 0 for 4 game, and Georgia got shut out Sunday 7 to 0. Just this one fraction of a moment in time. Because you know what? You know what Charlie Condon's doing right now? Charlie Condon leads the nation in home runs. Charlie Condon leads the nation in batting average. Do you feel like you've been set up? It, you have. April Fools. I got you. I even got my producer. She put the uh, she put the graphic up there. I got you, Kaylee. Charlie Condon leads the nation with he did go for four on Sunday. He did go for four on Sunday, but he leads the country with a 505 average. He's got 19 home runs, and he made a diving catch in center field uh, to help Georgia escape uh, what could have been a, a big inning for Tennessee Friday night. Dog Nation was there when Georgia beat Tennessee 16 to two. 16 to 2. First time ever that Tennessee had been run ruled. And uh, and it happened right there uh, at Lindsey Nelson Stadium. I couldn't believe it. A lot of Tennessee fans said, "Are well, you going to be here tomorrow night?" I said, "No, no, this is the game we were here to we were here to cover." Charlie Conan, what an incredible start to the year. Uh Corey Collins also amazing of late. Coach Wes Johnson in these Saber metrics. I mean, he gives Georgia a chance to win. They really don't have the pitching. Uh, to be beating a team like Tennessee that's top 10 in hitting and top 10 in pitching and number five in the country. But Georgia went up there and got it done. Um, pretty amazing. Georgia baseball, 22 and six, four and five in the SEC. Folks, if you're 500 in the SEC, you're awful darn good because the SEC is unbelievable in baseball. Diamond Dogs will be on the road uh, next weekend at Mississippi State. That's going to be another tough road trip. 
Uh, they'll look to get one, uh, ideally two. If you can get a sweep, buy a lottery ticket in the SEC, you get a sweep on the road. It just doesn't happen. Uh, but if you can get one, that's kind of a push. Uh, if you can get two, good job, you know. And and that's what this team's trying to do. They're you get to the end of the year, and Wes is hoping he can develop the pitching every single week and get a little bit better because the bats are big, the bats are heavy. So uh, I'm going to close it out. I hope you guys have enjoyed the show tonight. I hope you've made some comments. I hope you'll share this on Facebook and share it with your friends. I like doing the show every Monday night. I like going over football. Uh, we've had some bonus basketball time this year with this unique NIT run. The baseball team has given us something to talk about. The softball team's elite. We'll talk a lot more about those ladies as the year progresses. I'm sure you're going to see a lot of Georgia softball on television. You're going to hear a lot about their players featured because they have some of the best in the country. And now baseball uh, becoming more relevant. Of course, uh, we've got a couple more weeks of football, and we know how much everyone loves Georgia football. Very soon, we'll get to see Georgia football in their G-Day game on April 13th. And then the dogs will go to work with the portal. There'll probably be a few guys leaving. You know there will be. But there might be a couple more coming because Kirby is not going to rest. Uh, he made that statement. He doesn't just want to be relevant. He wants to be dominant. And I suppose that's the message. Uh, that's a good message to end with tonight. So I want to thank my producer, Kaylee Manzel. I want to thank you for watching. You can follow me on Twitter at Mike Griffith 32. Don't forget every day, Dog Nation Daily with Brandon Adams, 10 a.m. Wednesday night, Jeff Centel. And then on Thursday night, you just never know what Kaylee and Connor are going to be talking about. That's a really fun program. Hope you get a chance to catch that and hope you have a great week, everybody.